joining us here on PM this Monday, when again, Parliament has, of course, rightly so, been dominating the conversations, particularly around the budget in the last week, a budget that affects all of us. We've seen how it went. There was a heated conversation around it in Parliament and outside Parliament because of the far-reaching measures in the budget. In the end, the budget was indeed passed, but it has led to a conversation around the benefits of a hung parliament that of course was the talk of town in the wake of the aftermath of the 2020 election. So today we're going to look put the parliament debate and the outcome in the forthcoming debate around the appropriations all into contest and then look back a bit in the last few weeks since this parliament uh, started his life to see if we are reaping this benefit that we had many governance experts tell us is a real reason why you voted the way you did vote we we'll look at whether it's become business as usual. This is the parliament as it stands currently in 137, 138 with the minority side. Um, of course, um, having the, the 137 and then the majority side with one independent 138. Now, we've seen the budget as I stated already. The minority side had several concerns with it. The taxes, it affects you, it's of everybody else. And yet, when the end, when they finished, that cliche still played out. They had their say, the other side had their way, the budget was approved, and it came down to a vote. It was a head count. We normally won't see that play out in a parliament when it comes to the budget. But I guess for the first time, and I'm going to be joined by people who know the workings of parliament, it went down to a vote. And in the end, this was the outcome. The yes side, and, I, it, and this was on party lines, by the way, that is the NDC uh, side secured 134 of the votes as against the MPP's 137. What this means for the NDC, though, is that although they had 137 people in the House, they only managed to pull in 134 minus three people, right? We understand what happened to those three people. We understand who they are. They all had, from what I understand, genuine reasons why they couldn't be there. And again, the, minority, the majority side managed to pull all their members in, into the house and got the vote in. That raised questions for many people who thought it, it, when it comes to pulling people into the house, it will be the governing party who will struggle because they have ministers who have to work. And normally you won't get all of them in, but they are doing a good job at getting their members in, in these matters. Because this is not the only time we have seen this vote play out. Again, when it came to the approval of the ministers, there were three ministers who had issues surrounding them, which is how Akum Singh, uh, Upon Kruma, and the Free Yakuto. Guess what? When it came to voting again, the NPP side carried the day. And again, if you see the numbers that turned out, many of the NPP NDC members um, voted for, for the people, in spite of the fact that the minority side had raised several concerns and from what we heard, had put their uh, approval on hold. So that clearly, um, some say it's not satisfying the wishes of, of the people. But um, we've heard that this parliament, and the president has said it countless number of times in the last few weeks, that they must work together. Are we seeing that consensus building in the wake of what we saw in December? Is the, are both sides working together the way we thought they would because of the outcome of the elections? It's a conversation that we must have because this is the speaker's nomination and election. It is unprecedented in our history that we have an opposition party with a speaker. And many said when this happened, that this is an affirmation of the people's real wishes, that for the first time, another arm of government will have the man who is at the helm of it being the member from the opposition. So are we seeing the benefits of this? This is something that we'll be looking into tonight. My guests are joining me. Guess who? Alexander Fenyomarke, he is the deputy majority leader in the house. I'm delighted to have him. Also joining me is um, Mahama Yarega, of course Boku. He's joining me as the MP for, for that area. Very uh, vocal gentleman uh, in the house to look at parliament recently and all that has happened and look forward. Stay with me here on PM Express. And thank you for joining us here on PM Express. It's a very important conversation about, about Parliament. We've had a few weeks now of tasting what it would be like for this very historic Parliament as it is currently 
um, structured um, with the numbers in the House. There's been some significant decisions that the Parliament itself had to take. I guess the most crucial, even more than the ministerial nominees, is the budget, because the budget affects everybody in this country. We've seen how that has played out in the House, and of course there has been an approval, but it's not done yet, because there is the appropriations debate that will also happen, um, where the actual monies will be decided as to where it goes. There's also a conversation around that. I am delighted that I've been joined by two uh, leading voices in the House, and one of them is a leader in the uh, on the MPP side is Alexander Fenyomake. He's a deputy um, majority leader, uh, the youngest in our, in our history, correct? No, no, no. He's not? Okay, one of the youngest. Um, so I'm delighted to have you, Mr. Fenyomake. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Also joining me is um, Mahama Yariga, MP for uh, Bokusen. Mr. Yariga, thank you very much uh, thank you, for thank you. joining me here thank in the you. studio. Uh, Mr. Fenyomake is the Appropriations debate already started. I would get a hint that it will be this week. Yes, uh, we, we've started with the estimates. Uh, normally, we need to uh, pass the budget, approve it, and then we begin with the estimates. So committees are at work. Okay. Uh, various agencies are meeting their committees. We started over the weekend. Uh, we continue today. Today, uh, Defence and Interior <coughs> Committee met all some of the agents. It will continue tomorrow and then the report will start coming in and uh, finally we'll get to appropriation and mandate is given to the executive to spend and also uh, the next step will be the levies following the legal process of coming with a bill to the house, amendment here and there then the whole government machinery will be in place. Of course, we have also an outstanding vetting to be done. Uh, Honorable Ken of Is he back in? Happy to, uh, to hear he's back. Oh, he's back in Ghana. Uh, very hearty, and I pray we get to vet him as quickly as we can. I'm sure that will be a decision of the appointment committee pretty soon. And then we get to the final stage of deputy ministerial um, uh, nominees coming in uh, as Mr. President will communicate. So I'm sure for those of us on the appointment committee, we have a busy time ahead of us. Yeah. Um, Would you do the finance minister first before the deputies? Yes, that's very crucial. I'm sure um, deputies are not yet in. In, yeah. They will, Mr. President hasn't communicated that to 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 speaker. So I'm sure once. Uh, we have uh, the finance minister designated in. Um, steps will be taken to deal with that as quickly as possible. So we move on. Okay. I mean, so explain to me, I mean, for the audiences. So what happened last week then? Um, because you mentioned that you're now going to get the approval to spend. But we heard the budget had been approved. I mean, so I thought that was it. But that's not it. Please explain. That's the policy, that's the policy statement for... What was read on the floor. Year. Yes. So now... You go to the, the, the expenditure itself and then the, the agencies that have their budgets submitted them to the executive, they would have to come. It's a form of accountability. And this is where we also do our oversight. So you now tell us, in 2020, you were given such an amount. What happened? Were there releases? If there were no releases, tell us how come? How did you spend it? Did you overspend? Bear in mind that we have the PFM Act, mm. which in itself introduces a whole fiscal discipline regime. Don't spend beyond a certain level. Or if it's not been approved and you spend it, it's a criminal offense. Of course, there's also uh, a caveat in times of uh, emergency, like what we have, uh, COVID pandemic, uh, finance minister coming to uh, parliament to ask for a freeze on that which same was approved. So we look at all of these. And I must tell you, sometimes people get us wrong in the way we do our politics. And I'm also sure is the way we create that impression to the public. You see, at committee meeting, there's nothing like partisan interest. 
people ask questions freely. In fact, if you are not careful and you go overly partisan, your head, your leader is likely to whip you to fall in line. If you come, if you, you are privileged to sit in our committee meetings, you wonder, that, ah, what's happening? And even on the floor, I should say about 95, 97% of our work get approved by consensus uh, without going to uh, partisan voting or somebody calling for a headcount or a division. All right, when I say division, well, you know, you'd have to take a secret ballot, um, you know, on a matter because somebody is challenging a voice vote. If you say headcount, that's the first step after challenging uh, a, a voice, voice vote. So you count those who are against or for. So largely we do our work quietly and agree by consensus the way to go. I recall 2013 to 2017, I was a member of the Defense and Interior Committee. Issues will come and will be advised, look, these are security matters. You don't go partisan on these. And that has been the practice when we also came into office. If the finance ministry, they come up with issues, you know that well, you may have a principled partisan position against this. The point is that express your view, but that is not to suggest that the one taking the decision is wrong. Perhaps you disagree or that you disagree in principle. So for instance, look at this budget. When I had my turn to debate, I asked the NDC a simple question, rhetorically. Now, what is your alternative? Because now they are the government in waiting. There are two ways of funding and expenditure. One, you borrow. Two, taxation <clears throat> levies. If you impose taxation, if you impose a levy, the populace will cry. You will cry. It's too much. If you go and borrow, opposition will say, hey, yeah, the cut. you are over borrowing. So these are two necessary evils to support your expenditure. Because nobody has asked, where does the state get money to construct roads, hospitals? Each one of us in our various constituencies, the demand on us is we need infrastructure. How do we get infrastructure? Money, you have to borrow. If you are borrowing, today we say lower middle income country. So you are not getting the grant as much as you expect. You are not getting concessionary loans. People now think that you have what it takes to get commercial loans. Now, if you want to borrow against receivables, as in issuing bonds or engaging in smart borrowing, as my good friend said, Tekpe, uh, uh, introduced Morning, in the days of, uh, uh, of the NDC when he was a finance minister, somebody would say, oh, why would you want to do a Japan royalties? Why would you want to go float shares? But the point is, for any government to survive, that government will need to have revenue, have the resources, have the mix. Either your own assets that you are getting dividends from a commercial Entity government has an interest, you get a dividend, you have some assets somewhere, somebody is giving you grants, you raise tax, you get take a facility, you spend. So I think that we need to shift the narrative, the conversation, move to prudence, efficiency. The discussion civil society, the Ghanaian public should focus on now is how to ensure that whatever we have as a nation, we spend wisely, efficiently, ensure that right steps are taken for the limited resources to be, yeah. go for, I mean, for, to, to benefit the All ordinary of, uh, person. Let me bring him on higher, Mr. Ayaga. So to the heart of the question, some of the questions he's touched on, but the minority side did some work in raising the concerns. And I mean, taxes have been imposed, at the time when the economy was, was facing the COVID situation. In spite of all the concerns you raised, and largely, if you listen to the public conversation, it's a sense that you have the public on your side. When it came down to voting, 
although the people of Ghana gave you numbers to manage to, because in fact, if you pull all your people in the house, there would have been a tie on the matter of the budget statement, the policy statement alone, because 137, 137 would have been the case. But it didn't turn out like that. You had three people short. And all your concerns that were raised and articulated, in that sense, voting decides everything. It's almost like a winner takes all. The budget has been approved. As it is now waiting for the preparation. What's your thinking on those who say the benefits that we're expecting to get from the hung parliament, the reason why they gave you all these numbers, hasn't really accrued? Well, um, let me just say good evening and to you and to your viewers and my deputy leader. I, I think we need to really assess what our proper expectations ought to be. Mm. The first thing that I keep repeating and repeating to, to people is that on any given day, if there is a vote and we are all to vote along party lines, the NPP side is supposed to win on any given day. If we are to vote along party lines, the NPP side is going to win. Why? Because they are one, three, seven, plus yes. one person who has opted to do business with them, impliedly to vote mm. alongside the NPP. And then you have an NDC side of one, three, seven. So on any given day, if there's going to be a vote, and we're all to vote along party lines, uh, it will just be clear that MPP will win where the vote is supposed to be by a simple majority, which is if you win by one vote, you have won. won. So they will get 138 and we will get 137. The situations where NDC or MPP could win, I mean NDC could win, mostly is where there is secret ballot. Where there is secret ballot, there is a possibility that NDC could win. Because but there's also a possibility that MPP could win. As it could it go played, either way. As it played out in the ministerial As voting. it played out in the ministerial voting, and as, and it, as played it played in out in the election, the election of the speaker. That opportunity to have NDC win, most of the time, is likely when there is secret ballot. And it's interesting, in the case of the speaker's case, some MPP, one MPP or two MPP guys voted with you. We assume that. that, that yes. We assume. Yes. In the case of the ministers, several more of your people voted with the, with the MPP line. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is it. Because if but, you look at the numbers, yeah. I mean, it, it speaks for itself. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but you see, the issue is, what were the stakes in the election of the speaker? And what were the stakes in the voting for the approval of ministerial nominees? What were the stakes? In the election of the speaker, the stakes were high. Because you are talking about the number three person in the country. You are talking about the person who will moderate affairs in the house. And the advantages that moderating the affairs in the house bring to the side that successfully sponsors a candidate to occupy the seat. The stakes were high. And we appreciated how serious the stakes were. And you saw the fight that we put up uh. to win that contest. And, and, and we won. And we won also because some people on the MPP side believed in the cause of this particular person as speaker. So in a sense, we won because both sides of the divide, there were some people on the other side who believed that Bagwin should become speaker, irrespective of the fact that they belong to a party that has also put up somebody for the post of speakership. What were the stakes when it came to the approval of the ministers? I mean, there are, there, there are many who felt that, listen, the stakes were not that high. Really, I mean, but you built it up to be one that is high. I mean, the minority, you should hold statement dramatically saying that you, you're putting some ministers on hold. Yes, because one, we vetted the ministers. Uh, 
Two, we agreed that many of them should go through because they had met the minimum constitutional mm -hmm. criteria. But then we recommended that some should not be approved. But that was just a committee made up of, you know, uh, 13 from our side and 13 from the other side. But our side thought that three nominees should not go through. But then when it comes to ministerial nominees, so many factors are at play. And I have said this a couple of times, not that I want to justify what happened, but I also want people to appreciate the internal dynamics of a group such as, you know, 137 members of parliament. You will have ministers, ministerial nominees, who come from particular people's constituencies or regions. And beyond your big national politics, those MPs are looking at their own local politics, that they've never had the benefit of somebody being nominated to be a minister. And then a party has nominated somebody from their enclave to be a minister. You want them to reject them. And then you, who is a member of parliament who has been voted for by the same community who voted for you in the parliamentary elections to win, but also voted for the president in the presidential election to win. So you are in parliament, the president is in the presidency, and then he nominates one of you to become a minister, and the person comes before, and then they count the votes, and then it is seen in the tally that your side, all of you voted against, in which case they will add you to the group that voted against. But it's perfectly possible that uh, not all of you voted against, maybe people from the other side mixed mm -hmm. up the vote. But once the numbers are 137, 138, the assumption that everybody is going to make is that the 137 that voted against are NDC members, and that the 138 that voted for are MPP members. But you could have a mix within the MPP people. Some people, 20 people could vote against then within the end, these people, another 20 people could vote for, and it will even out. It will even out in a situation where it will look like 137, 137, but not all the 137 on one side were MDC, and not all the 137 on the other side were, were NPP. But your constituents will immediately read into the voting pattern that you objected to. A kinsman, uh, somebody from your so, so, so at those, least so dynamics your, are there. So, so there are internal dynamics that sometimes make it difficult for leadership to hold a cohesion when it comes to matters like approving people nominated but what about for the ministerial, ministerial uh, uh, portfolios. Because that, that's where the stakes are high, but mostly for the people. The, for the budget, the stakes were high, but you could see also that in the case of the budget, it wasn't secret ballot. True. It was head count. And because of head count, it was easier for leadership to make sure that everybody on either side told the party line. Yeah. And so you saw that all NDC members who were there accounted for uh, a no vote. And all the MPP and yeah. the one who wasn't there that day, but all the MPP people who were there but you must accounted for the no. You're marking in his group that in spite of them having ministers who were busy, they managed to pull their members in the house to vote for a cause that they believed in. Well, I mean, there are a lot of things that happened that morning. Uh, one is, were we expecting to vote? Maybe, maybe not, is that okay? So it depends on the anticipation of either side. Um, so- But the certainty, was also on their side, but they still managed to get their people there. Well, I mean... I mean, and other, the, other complication of having several ministers who were busy around the country possibly doing other things. Well, I mean, I'll, com I'll, I'll, com I'll, well. no, I'll commend them that day for being able to pull in all their members. But the three that we fell short of also had, you know, uh, very genuine reasons why they were absent. I mean, somebody is burying the mother, you cannot insist that his parliamentary duty is, is much more important than burying his mother. Mm. I mean, Atamil's someone who was burying his sister, I mean, you can't say that 
I mean, uh, perform the funeral of his sister. You can't say that uh, being there to vote is, is more important than being at the funeral of his, 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 his sister. I mean, his elder brother, the late president, died. Uh, they are left with only three. He, um, Katman, and then the sister. And then the sister has uh, departed, and they are performing the funeral. You can't say he, has to, he, has, has, he should absent himself from the sister's uh, burial. One had COVID. You can't say he should leave... Uh, confinement and forcefully come and vote because we are voting uh, the budget. He's still at the hospital. I mean, you can go and check. He's there. So I, for the two, I won't say there are circumstances beyond control, but they are explainable you know, circumstances. For the one, it's circumstances beyond his uh, control. And very often, when your leadership see that, they try to avoid a vote. There were two issues. There was a choice of not voting so that the public will not even know that you didn't have the full complement of your side there. Mm -hmm. But then you would have missed the point, which is that you want to register your protest against the taxes. Which you did quite vociferously. Uh, vociferously in the debate, but it has to culminate in the vote okay. to show that you are not just debating to excite people in the drama of debating, but that you are actually going to vote against it, mm. which has... You've been in media practice for so many years now. When was the last time you heard us vote on the budget? On no, the principles of the budget? I haven't. This I have been in parliament, and this is the first time yeah. that we're voting against the principles in a budget. This is the first time. This is the first time where we're registering our protests against taxes by actually voting against the budget policy. So we just wanted to register the protests. It wasn't as if we assumed that if we voted and there was head count, uh, we would easily win. I mean, that, that, that is. So, so, so that, is, that is what I think people should have in mind. There may be situations where if it's a secret ballot, we have a chance. Yeah. But if it's head count or voice vote and both sides whip the sides, chances are that we will not well, win. I mean, Mr. Fanyo Marking, so that, that's an interesting. He comments you, by the way. Um, which in politics you don't hear much of. Um, I mean, so back to the budget conversation. Because of all the impact that it's going to have on the lives of people, but you managed to get it through in the consensus. Some say, well, I mean, your side didn't quite reflect what the Ghanaian general population was feeling in approving. You just use your numbers to, to get it through. What's your response to that? That the parliament didn't do a good, a good service to the people. That if you did, you would have listened at least taking some of the measures out of the, out of the budget and, and passed in a certain way as a minority was suggested? Well, this evening, uh, Mr. Yerega uh, has clearly told us that they brought uh, Mr. Bagbin to have an advantage uh, in, in the way business is conducted in Parliament. And that is the reason why they did what they did. I thought uh, a speaker's role is to be an impartial ombudsman. I never knew practically they stood to gain some advantage. And so we would be watching that space as clearly. I'm surprised you say that, but that's, and, that's uh, the reason why we have a speaker uh, for my party. And <laughs> two uh, ministerial nominees. You see, we have to control the extremists who try to impose their views on us as politicians. Mm. Because it won't take this country anywhere. And that's a crisis the NDC in Parliament is having now. They have a crisis? Sami Jemfi wrote, read True. every single line of that letter. When I first saw it, I thought it was some fake news. Fake news. Until people said, look, this is Sami Jemfi. Read it well. And I think the time has come for the NDC leadership in parliament to call off the bluff of the extremists who are operating outside the, the parliament. The time has come for the leadership of NDC to be assertive in parliament, be firm, and educate their extremists that this is not the way parliamentary politics is conducted. Because, you see, we work with certain levels of certainty. We also concede that there are times that partisan principles 
will make it difficult for you. I've served in parliament in opposition before, and I remember our leadership at the time telling us that, look, young men, we aren't going to be here forever. Yes, we know you've just come. The zeal is there. The youthful exuberance. The exuberance is there. <laughs> but in parliamentary politics, express your view, but don't hold hostage the fortunes of a government. They are running the state. Let them go on, but express your disagreement. But you see, all of a sudden, the NDC machinery in parliament is becoming so weak. Now they are confused because what would the full soldiers say? How would they react? If I were to be Harun Idrisu, I would just simply resign and leave the scene for them. Because one day, one day, why? You are, not, you are a government in waiting. You are not going to be in opposition forever. Let's be real. We won, they lost, they won, we lost. So whatever you are doing today, if one day we also come into opposition and you are in government, we go for the hands up and tell you that this is what you did. You think the extreme? No, no, I am saying that the extremists operating at their party headquarters eh, are the people destroying their parliamentary strength you now. think that played out in the, the way the budget vote? Of course. Was. I mean, from day one, you see, they created a predetermined mindset when we're doing the voting. And somebody like Ayariga, my senior at the bar, so much respect him. He's a moderate. He has his principled views. And I'm sure you cannot push him. Harun Idrisu, fine gentleman, smart politician. So when you want to push him to go the extremist way, it's a difficult thing. You should control your backbench. Who are in backbench? At backbench, if Akoto, Akoto say, calls you to order, you dare not. He was not even a leader, but he was a chairman of a ranking member. Our leaders, you see Papa Wuzan Kuma, eh, Afenyo Wunde, the Mazna Warrior. Control your voice. Has the NBC leadership lost control about their backbench? I think so. I think so. Because, you see, we are running a government together. It's not because you are in opposition, you say, oh, it is they against us, as for us, we don't care. It is them. But every month, opposition, minority, ma majority, you are paid. We are paid. You need project in your constituency. You want people need water. Sanitation issues must be resolved. In any case, what was their contention? Taxes. Look, let me face reality. This uh, Elsa, uh, Esla, NDC, they first imposed... 19% levy. Later, when they were in difficulty, they did additional 27%. Put together, my math is not good, but it is 46%. We are saying the COVID and the one on sanitation. COVID, 2.7%. Sanitation, 3%. Altogether, 5%, 5 5.7%. Now, you did 46%. We are doing 5.7%. How do you say that ye wo, you and who are dying, you did 46%. And we are saying that, look, in COVID, the situation we find ourselves, let us do this 2.7%, which is 10 pesos, all right? Let's impose it on petroleum uh, uh, product. Let's use that. Get more vaccines. You have gotten your vaccine. I have gotten mine. I don't know about uh -huh. yours. You have gotten yours. Did you pay for it? No. Did I pay for it? Let us find a way of dealing with this. Two, how to dispose of this waste. It costs money. In doing so, whilst we will dispose of them, we are generating income because companies will do that. They will employ people. If you come to sanitation, it's Ghanaian companies that are going to do this. We do documentaries all over. Joy FM. Sanitation is a problem in Accra. Sanitation is a problem everywhere in this country. So let's have a better look at our sanitation problem. In fact, in 2019, a bipartisan committee of parliament went round and mm -hmm. looked at the sanitation situation in this country. And in fact, a report that they brought to the House floor, which report was adopted, recommended, among other things, that let us find space in our budget to impose a sanitation levy. 
what this government, these are the two critical things that our colleagues are talking about. I am saying, look at all the other reliefs that government is giving, particularly to the hotels and the restaurants, those in the hospitality industry. Then at the back of this, government is maintaining all the social intervention programs, NAPCO, free SHS, the continuous payment of the um, nursing training allowance, teacher training allowance, all right? Every single social intervention program that government introduced. Government is not using COVID as an excuse to say that, look, because of COVID, I don't have money. Government is so sensitive to the situation the ordinary Ghanaian finds himself, herself, to the extent that no single public sector worker has been sent home. Every single public sector worker receives his or her pay at the end of the month. The due date, pe -pe -pe. SNIT, retirement benefits, people are receiving it. Pe -pe -pe. I am saying that we are in a difficult situation together. We cannot be going out borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. How do we adjust? In any event, all these monies, the, the 10 percent, uh, the, the 10 uh, pesos and the 20 pesos that we are going to get, even if you add them in the budget, it will not even match the expenditure in that very sector. Health, add the, the, 10, the 10 pesos in the year and compare that to the expenditure on, on health, this situation we find ourselves. So we need to together explain to the full soldier who is telling you that government is burdening them. So vote against the tax. So my question is, what is the alternative? You are in opposition. You're saying that what we are doing is bad. No problem. What is your alternative? Mm. NDC held a press conference. They never told Ghanaians what alternative they, they had. Cut the waste. No. You see, cut the waste in government. No, no. Cutting waste is a position I hold. So give us the specific areas of waste. And to me, that is, that is where I say that the whole construct must be re-looked at. And that is where I think that so far our civil society is helping. Some of them sometimes go overboard. But some of them also come up with very constructive facts. Mm. And if we take them on board, we may think they are irritating as politicians, but they are necessary evil. We need them. Let's look at it. If you cut waste, bring the suggestions on board. But for the time being, what is your alternative? I mean, you've said Nearly a lot. Nearly talking about cutting waste. Is that a lot yeah. that I, I yeah. want him to yeah. respond before I go yeah. for a quick break? Yeah. Because, because he says that yeah. you, you, you've, lost, you've lost the plot in the house when it comes to your control over your, your backbenches. And is there a conflict between parliamentary business from the minority side and what the party wants. Situate it against what Samir Jinfi said. I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm not importing my own way. Samir Jinfi yeah, said I, it I, all. I want to hear him I mean, on this. You, you agree with him? I that's think that problem. it is unfair to bash the so-called foot soldiers. These are citizens with a legitimate interest in how this country is run. These are people who toiled day and night to produce victors in parliamentary elections with some aspiration as to what the victors should do when they go to parliament, which is to hold the government in check. And so to begin to look down on these people and assume that they lack the intellectual capacity to appreciate the rudiments of governance or what the proper public expectation should be is most condescending, in, in my opinion. What about this? So, so I, 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 think, I, think, I think we should move away from, from that argument. Listen carefully. I think that in every instance, the, 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 the so-called foot soldiers have a legitimate case why they think in certain ways. First and foremost, if you take the approval of the ministers, I mean, they had concerns, concerns that 
it wasn't just the foot soldiers, but civil society, people in the media, yeah. you know, expressed the same concerns. Yes, people had people expressed concerns. So it wasn't the foot soldiers. It wasn't the foot soldiers. So to sit down and think that the NDC foot soldiers are the problem is is is, is mistaken. What about the few extremist now, executives now in your the, party? The, the, the perception about extremist executives. No, they are not extremist executives. They are executives of the party on whose ticket we rode to victory and we are sitting in parliament. Mm. And so they have some aspirations. And if they express them, they are not extremists. So I disagree with the labeling of those as extremist uh, executives. Well, I, I tried, I tried, I tried. Letter. Yes, yes. His open letter. Sami Jemfi is not an extremist executive. Sami Jemfi was simply expressing, and I'm telling you, Sami Jemfi was expressing the views of many people you, you who are not him. even you NDC. Do you agree with him? Oh, I agree with Sami Jemfi. I'm not, I, 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 no, on the issue of the speaker, oh. I publicly said okay. on television, on radio, that he had crossed the line okay. when he roped the speaker into his commentary about the performance what of the NDC. about attack on yourselves? I have no issue with his attack on me, and I have said it on television that I have no issue because he is the national executive member of my party. I chose to run on that party's ticket. Mm. And so to some extent, there's some supervisory relationship mm. that exists between the national executive and the, the parliamentary it, caucus. If that's the case, you should be doing their bidding. But in two no, instances, yes. you haven't. In, in, a, in a sense, yes. But you, you haven't. You should, you should, in the minister's you should, case, you, you should, did you not. Should, you should, you in should, the budget, You should try to pursue that interest to the extent that that interest is legitimate. It, w and, it wasn't, and, it wasn't and, legitimate and, in the minister's and, case? No, no. no I'm saying that, so it was legitimate in the sense that it wasn't just something that only NDC members were saying, but even a wider civil society yeah. expressed concern about some nominees and genuinely felt that parliament should not approve those nominees. So if my national executive member uses very hard words in, in rebuking his side, who from the voting pattern would not have followed the general sentiment, he, 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 he is at liberty to do so. I, 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 I don't take issue. Apparently, you agree with him, but you voted ag against his position. People voted against his position. You can't tell who voted. Oh, I mean, I get it's, it. The, I po mean, the, point, the point is the that... Collective. The point is the that, collective. No, 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 the point is that over 100 members of the NDC caucus voted along the position that people like Sami Jemfi expressed. True. A few people voted against. Now, I also disagree with the effort to put the entire 137 in the same category and lambast them because there was secret balloting and then a few people voted against and uh, the, the lines that the party wanted to vote. As your leadership or, or most control to... over the backbenchers. Will you say that because NPP lost the speakership election, that the NPP leadership lost control over their backbenchers? By that logic, it will apply too. I don't think so. No, but I mean, if you ask no, no, me, I don't think so. I, mean, he, I, I think that he, he was, he has is, just taken over is, the job is, when yeah, that happened. So it's a I'm more sure complex, it's a more complex dynamics. And that, when I started, now, I guess I because of what you said, I tried to explain that although the leadership in the budget instance had had a backroom negotiation, yes, came to the floor and somehow abandoned the strategy and told the line I didn't of, say that. No, I mean, it, it was... Did, did I say that? No, I, I didn't mean, say that. There was a sense in which that, that played out in terms no, of what I, you're saying. I, I'm right? just said, did I say that? I didn't say that. I didn't say there was backstage lobbying and discussions. Can you read out? Can, so, I, I want so, us to... So, so, no, no, sorry, no, 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 I, 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 I haven't finished. I haven't finished. No, no, I haven't finished. No, no, I haven't finished. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let him finish. Let him finish. Let him make his point. No, you're talking about the budget. And why we are opposed to the budget. One is you said we passed taxes. Yes, which government didn't pass taxes? But we are saying that in a pandemic covid stricken environment where the whole world, countries are rather, you know, pushing resources into providing the economy, stimulus, providing stimulus, paying our checks to people. Paying our checks to people, you don't tax the people. That, that, that fundamentally is the, is the flaw. And we are saying that in a pandemic environment, you should engage in, you know, um, uh, you should watch your expenditure, basically. That's, that's what we're saying. And we're also saying that the existing tax regime, if you are effective in collecting what ought to be collected, 
you will be able to meet your targets. What is your target? 75 billion, okay? And last year, you had a target, a revised target of 55 billion, and you exceeded the target even when the pandemic was at its zenith. So if we believe that we are coming out of the pandemic and you set a little higher target, if you work hard, we believe that you should be able to meet that target. So the taxes are not because of the pandemic. The taxes are because you have mismanaged the economy to a point where the debt overhang is just too high. Every money that we get has to go into paying salaries and interest on, on loans. So, so it is your mismanagement. And you talked about the pandemic. During the pandemic, the expenditures that you engaged in and how you spent it, profligate expenditure, totally unnecessary. Everybody in this country saw what you did. It coincided with elections. And so you wrote on the pandemic and spent those monies in a way that you know, gave you an electoral advantage. That is the fact. That is the fact. And now you're asking the Ghanaians that, well, you took all these free water, free electricity, free this, free that. We gave you money to you know, capitalize your businesses, and we did that, and we did this for you. And so now you have to pay. It's time to pay. Stay with me. I want to take a quick break. I'll, 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 I'll hear from Avenue Mark again him as we begin to wrap up on this very interesting conversation. This is PM Express. And thank you for staying with us. This is still PM Express. My guest is still Deputy uh, Majority Leader. Uh, Alexander Fenyo Marking, MP for Futu. Also with me is uh, Mahama Yariga, who is MP for Boku Central. Um, you have raised an issue about um, the extremists in the, in the ranks of the NDC who seem to have, um, you know, overpowered almost the, the ability to sort of, you know, stand their ground in the House. He, he contests that um, vehemently. So, Mr. Yariga says that he agrees <coughs> with these words as expressed by his national communication officer against himself and his other colleagues. For the avoidance of doubt, I shall repeat what his colleague or his supervisory officer said. Comrades, the betrayal we have suffered in the hands of the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Alban Bagbin, the leadership of our parliamentary group, particularly Haruna Idrisu and Hon Honorable Muntaka Mubarak, and dozens of our MPs is what strengthens me to work hard for the great NDC to regain power. He goes on to say, this is a time for us to insist on the right changes in the leadership of the NDC group in parliament or forget about them completely. The current leadership have lost their moral authority to lead and not fit to sit on the front bench of NDC side of the house. More importantly, it's about time we understood that we don't have any NDC Speaker of Parliament. No, we don't. We have a Speaker who rode on the back of the NDC into office and to pursue his own parochial agenda and nothing more. You trust them at your own peril. He goes on and on to say that they have sold their conscience. So, I'm saying that from the submissions of uh, Mr. Yarga on this matter, he says, yes, he agrees with him. He agrees that there must be changes in their leadership. He agrees that Mr. Bagby uh, has sold his conscience and all that. He agrees with all of that. I think he says he makes an exception in the well, case so of the Well, so apart from the, the speaker, he agrees that uh, Harun Idrusu and Co. should leave. And I'm saying that's where I have a problem with him. And that's where I say that there's a problem with the, with the NDC parliamentary machinery. Because you and I know, you and I know, that the basis of rejecting a nominee must be constitutional. Simplicity, you're a lawyer, 20 years, Harvard trained, you would want to say that because somebody expresses mm. adverse views about an individual, you would then go ahead and say you are voting against the person. Let's put that aside. Yeah, we, we have 30 minutes. I need to get 30 Let's, seconds. I need, yeah, to get him, yeah, yeah. I need to get him to wrap up. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. On, on, that, on that. Yeah, on that issue, I didn't say I agree with him that 
Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> you said the only been an exception for speed. Yeah, yes. You said exception for speed. No, no, listen. I agree that, what's his name? <laughs> uh, Sami Jemfi mm -hmm. uh, and the rank and file of the party expressed their displeasure. They were just expressing their displeasure. No leadership of ours will be changed. So you don't agree that it should change? No leadership of ours will be changed. And changing leadership will not be of any assistance to anybody. But I agree with them when they express the disappointment, okay. the feeling of betrayal by w their own members of you parliament. Do their bidding in parliament. Will you do their bidding in, in, in if, if it is legitimate. Okay. If, if it is not, legitimate. If, if it is not, not we will resist it. Okay. If it is not, you resist And they know that I'm one of those who will openly resist it. But if it is legitimate, and, what, and, and they have legitimate what, what expectations. Cost, what cost to you, though? Because that has consequences. It has consequences, but then we, we have to live with consequences. Okay. We have choices. And lastly, the issue of nominees, that if they meet the constitutional threshold, if they meet the constitutional threshold, and yet the constitution says vote, when it comes to voting, you can vote for any reason. You can vote mm. because he's always wearing green and coming to parliament. Yeah. You can so, vote because of that. The, the, so I, I don't agree with the position that once somebody meets the constitutional... Pardon? Are you guided by 296? Then why did 296 say that? You don't have why, to why, 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 why did 296 well, well, say that? Why, well, well, did, why well, did the constitution well, well, say well, that well, MP should vote? I, I can promise you that this it's, conversation will have it again. I, I'm going to have it. But they've not made clear their grounds of opposition to, to the, the budget. The, they've not made clear. I said it. We just argued. We just said that the tax is... Enjoy the rest of your evening, gentlemen.